Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. We're delighted that you're, you've joined us today uh, for this meeting. As we begin this morning, let's kneel for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the incredible mercies that you have bestowed upon us. We can't even count them. For life, for provision in this life to sustain it, for protection, for the spirit of prophecy. Of course, ultimately for Jesus, through whom all these blessings come. We just are thankful for your word. We pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us today and to rivet truth deep within our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, the title of the talk this morning, Prophecy Update. Let's take a look. You know, I just came back from a trip to California and um, heard about an old friend, an old friend. I uh, still consider him my friend. I haven't spoken to him for several years. I've spoken in New Zealand a number of times. Uh, but the gentleman's name is Evan Sadler. Uh, Evan is an evangelist. He is an incredible, uh, has an incredible gift of sharing the truth with other people, uh, especially one-on-one -on -one in... Uh, you know, handing out books in that kind of a setting. Does a great job. Uh, he's handed out many Spirit of Prophecy books over the years at, great, at big events all over the world. Uh, he won't back down to anybody. Uh, that's Evan. Uh, he's a great guy. I enjoy him. I've spoken at his camp meetings in New Zealand. He's a very friendly gentleman. But I was... Uh, it was brought to my attention when I was out in the West Coast this past week that um, for some reason, and I don't know why, but for some reason Evan has gone off and teaches that the Jews rule the world today. Uh, you have got to be kidding. And Seventh-day Adventists listen to that nonsense. Uh, and it... It is. It's just plain nonsense, friend. Just plain nonsense. How prophetic and how pathetic. Come on, Evan. Come on. You know better than that. You know way better than that. Why at this point in time we would get sidetracked uh, is beyond me. It's beyond me. You know, the Bible... The Bible is so clear, so clear. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13 verses 1 to 10. We read about the first beast of Revelation 13, 1 to 10. It claims to be God on earth, claims power to forgive sins, receives power from the devil, Received a deadly wound in 1798. Paul, go ahead. Well, okay. Exalts the Sunday tradition above the seventh day Sabbath. Reigned through the dark ages for 1260 years. Persecutes God's people. The beast of Revelation 14, 9, which is the same as the first beast of Revelation 13, 1 to 10, can only be the papal system. 
Now, what are we going to do? I, I just... <laughs> Evan, come on! Dr. Lorraine Day, come on! It's not the Jews. All these characteristics pinpoint the papal power. Sometimes we don't proclaim it because somebody might be offended. I mean, how, how many times I've heard that. Don't talk about the beast of Revelation 13. It might offend somebody. Friends, if that becomes our barometer or our standard is offending somebody, we're in the wrong business. Jesus, throughout the Gospels, Christ was the most offensive person that ever lived. Constantly people were going away from him. And John the Baptist, and John the Baptist Paul. Absolutely. Absolutely. Are we going to stop proclaiming it? Or are we going to proclaim this precious message and let the chips fall where they may? Folk, the thousands of letters, of responses we've gotten from around the world, of Roman Catholics who have embraced the three angels' messages because they see the system they've been in. If we don't share that, friend, how can we say we love people? We don't love them. We love ourselves. Paul, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say, it's funny you brought, I mean, not funny, but you mentioned that about what this fellow was saying about the Jews. I've been hearing this lately. Yep. See, what bothers me about it, I mean, this came out of Nazi Germany, not just Nazi Germany, what you went back in the 1800s in England, uh, on the west side of England, it was very serious situation between the British and the Jews, they were deathly afraid of a, of a rioting. As a matter of fact, and I don't want to go into great detail, but uh, Jack the Ripper, they did catch, matter of fact, but he was a Jew, and they did never announced it because they were deathly afraid that London would be burned to the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two books out there written by the guys that caught Jack the Ripper, and he was a, a, a retarded Jewish man. Anyhow, long story short, what would they have in common with us? Why would the devil spark this? Hmm. Sabbath keepers. That mm -hmm. aggression that's already there underlying can be transferred to Seventh-day Adventists. When they, no, it's not the Jews. We got, it's them. Think about the, the, the logic behind that or the stratagem behind that. Interesting thought, Paul. Interesting. Just my thought. Sure, I appreciate that. Appreciate that. When, <laughs> you know, I've been watching this friend for 40 years. 40 years. Back at PUC with Desmond Ford. And then, you know, Adventists through the decades. Well, you know, it's like Evan Sadler says, it's the Jews. I remember sitting in a, at a park along the Sacramento River in Red Bluff, California a number of years ago, and a gentleman I highly admired for his stand against the book Questions on Doctrine. The man's name was Elder David Bauer, and Elder Bauer, bless his heart, as he got up to share that Sabbath afternoon by the Sacramento River. He started talking about the Jews ruling the world. I'm sitting there with my mouth, what? Are you kidding me? Friends, I raised my hand as Elder Bauer spoke, and I, I said, Elder Bauer, what about the first beast of Revelation chapter 13? What about all these characteristics I said, those don't apply to the Jews. They didn't rule the world for 1260 years through the Dark Ages. They didn't receive a deadly wound in 1798. They didn't exalt Sunday above the seventh-day Sabbath. 
I said, Elder Bauer, I cannot agree with you. You're, you're wrong. And Lorraine Day, and now Evan Sadler, what is this? Friends, we're playing right into Rome's hands, right into the papacy's hands. Because the papacy wants so desperately today to get the light of prophecy, the light of truth off of themselves and on to somebody else. What are we as Seventh-day Adventists doing who have the great controversy? It's unbelievable, friends. How about the whore of Revelation 17? Revelation chapter 17. Unites with government leaders. Claims their God again. They Both the first beast of Revelation 13 and the whore of Revelation 17. Both commit blasphemy. And that's claiming to be God and claiming power to forgive sins. The verse that proves that, John 10, 33, Mark 2, 5 to 7. They're a very wealthy church, Revelation 17, 4. They are the leaders of the apostate Protestant churches, Revelation 17, verse 5. They persecute God's people just like the first beast of Revelation 13. Revelation 17, 6 says they are a persecutor of God's people. They're locked in, the, locked in the name of the church that's identified as Babylon the Great of Revelation 17 is the name of a great city in the world. That's what Revelation 17, 18 says. Let's read that. Revelation 17 and verse 18. Notice what the Bible says. The woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So locked into the name of Babylon the Great, whoever that identifies, there in their name is the name also of a great city in the world. Jew? I don't know a big city in the world that's called Jew something. That's, that's just absurd, friends. Come on, Evan. Come on, Dr. Day. What are you thinking of? So obvious. Why do we tolerate garbage like that? Because, friends, that's what it is. That's what it is. It's, it's just... It's plain garbage. You say, oh, but Bill, it's not loving. Friends, the papacy, according to Revelation 17 and 18, the papacy is soon to suffer the judgments of heaven. And we are to call people out of Roman Catholicism. That's the most loving thing we can do. And to not proclaim that, friend? Well, again, that's not loving Roman Catholics. That's loving self. That's saying, well, I'm, I'm not going to put myself into danger. Somebody might get upset with me. Friends, that's the love of self. That is not the love of Christ, His truth, and His children that are still in Roman Catholic churches. Come out of her, my people, Revelation 18.4 says. Cody? I think another thing we need to um, consider with this whole issue with the Jews is remember the Jews, as they retain their position against Jesus Christ, when the children of Israel decided to crucify their Savior, they said, his blood be upon us and upon our children. And so the nation of Israel, when their probation closed at the stoning of Stephen, became a cursed nation. And that's what happened with the destruction of the temple in, 
in 70 AD where over 1.1 million people died because they were all flooding to their city because they thought it would protect them. And so you gotta, you gotta look at it from that angle as well. That this is a particular group of people who, ha who are under a curse as a, as a group, not as individuals, but as a group. They're under the curse of God and Satan has more control over that and therefore he has targeted them. He has targeted them for extinction on a number of occasions. And yes, those, there are individuals in the Jewish uh, religion as well as the people who can trace their bloodline back to Jews who have been in positions of extreme power throughout history. But the Bible is so clear in Revelation chapter 18 that the merchants of the earth were made rich by her, meaning Absolutely. that anybody who has lots of wealth and money, which when they talk about the international bankers, whether you're talking about G. Edward Griffin or some of these other historians that look at this stuff, what they're actually talking about is they're talking about the merchants of the earth. And the Bible says that the merchants of the earth are not above, but are below Rome and Absolutely. controlled by her. And the only reason they're wealthy is through their connection with her. Absolutely, Cody. Great point. Great point. Um, the Jewish international bankers, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The Bible says the merchants, Revelation 18, 15, the merchants of these things, which were made rich by her. They were made rich by Rome by their connection to Rome. F. Tupper Saucy's book, Rulers of Evil, pages 160 and 161 from the Encyclopedia Judaica, tells us that the most powerful of all the Jewish families, the Rothschild family, they're connected to the papacy. And that is where they get their power and their authority. That simple. Let's take a look at this. Don't we get it? If one domino falls in Adventism, many other dominoes fall too. If we're confused on the beast, then what's his mark? Who's his image? If we don't know who the whore is, then who are her harlot daughters? Who are the kings united with her? Revelation 17 makes no sense at all. Evan, you're wrong. You're wrong, Evan Sadler. Come on. Get clear. The Bible's clear. The great controversy is clear. Paul, please. You know where it leads to, Bill? Uh, I remember in the early 90s, we were going, handing out National Sunday Law books, Jan's book. It had just come out not too long before that. Well, we got called Catholic bashers at the local Seventh-day Adventist church, and we were asked to stop doing it, sure. which it did not. However, from cause to effect, without identifying what you're talking about, just recently, not in the, the two past, past, there was a baptism that took place here in Melbourne, Florida, of a woman who's attending Roman Catholic Church and Sabbath Church. Seventh-day Adventist Church. She was baptized in the Seventh-day Adventist Church while she's attending the Roman Catholic Church. And that's okay. I guess if she was going to synagogue, they would have kicked her out. <laughs> that's cause to affect, in my mind, mm -hmm. how subtle. Absolutely, Paul. It's, <laughs> it's pathetic, Paul. It, it's just absolutely pathetic. Pathetic what we are doing as God's professed people today. Pathetic. Well, so what is going on then? Hopefully we're clear now that it's not the Jews that are ruling the world, but it's the papacy. Revelation 13, 1 to 10, Revelation 17. Both tell us clearly of Rome's involvement paramount involvement in end-time events. 
So what specifically is the papacy doing today? Well, they're planning COP28. We've talked about COP26 and COP27. And of course, the COP has to do with climate change and helping the environment, saving the environment. That's Pope Francis's number one string on his violin. So the United Nations 2023 Climate Change Conference, COP28, is scheduled to take place in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, from November 30 to December 12. Already Pope Francis is pushing his climate encyclical as the model and solution for the world's largest international climate change summit. Now, just over a month ago, Pope Francis, during an interview with an Arabic language newspaper published daily in the United Arab Emirates, this is what Francis had to say. He said, in my encyclical Laudato Si, which came out about eight years ago now, on the care of our common home, I tried to ask what kind of world we want to leave for those who come after us. For the children who grow up, COP27 in Egypt, COP28 in the United Arab Emirates are essential occasions for the urgent appeal to be heard and to provide answers to the environmental crisis and to the cry of the earth, the cry of the poor who can no longer wait. Let us take care of creation. Here we go, friends. The gift of our good God. Clearly, Francis is all about climate change all about saving the earth, all about protecting the environment. The fact that the papacy controls mega industries across this world, according to Avril Manhattan's book, The Vatican Billions, it makes you wonder about Pope Francis speaking with forked tongue talking about saving the environment while its industries owned by Francis as the head of the Vatican that are creating such terrible ills within the air of this planet. Francis goes on, I encourage the United Arab Emirates in its efforts. I wish to it great success for the benefit of our planet, which is our common home. The only effective way to face this crisis is to find realistic solutions to the real problems of the ecological crisis. We must turn statements into action before it's too late. So Francis is pushing, friends, his agenda, as we have seen for several years now. He's pushing his climate change agenda. He's continues to discuss the ecological crisis facing the world. I want to thank Advent Messenger and Andy Roman for this information that he has brought our attention to. But this again, friends, this is Pope Francis's agenda. Climate change, saving the environment, that's what he's all about. And of course, again, friends, when Pope Francis talks about Laudato Si, when he talks about saving the environment, there are two other concepts that are glued to Pope Francis's mind. 
and one that we get from Laudato Si in the 237th paragraph are these words. On Sunday, our participation in the Eucharist has special importance. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. So friends, when Pope Francis talks about the healing of our planet, in Pope Francis' mind, he means Sunday. Sunday. And when Pope Francis says back here, we must turn statements into action before it's too late. Pope Francis' action when it comes to the environment and climate change, he's talking about Sunday, friends. He's talking about worshiping on the first day of the week. Sunday is the day of the resurrection, the first day of the new creation, whose first fruits are the Lord's risen humanity, the pledge of the final transfiguration of all created reality. It also proclaims man's eternal rest in God. Wow. You'd think there was something about Sunday, friends, the way Francis describes it. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Some more comments from Pope Francis as he arrived in Lisbon just recently for a World Youth Day. Lisbon Pope Francis made an impassioned plea for Europe to revive the ideals of its founders and seek to build bridges of peace, fraternity, and inclusion. World Youth Day, therefore, represents an opportunity to build together, said Francis, as it revives our desire to accomplish something new and different and to set sail together towards the future. You see, friends, throughout Francis's comments in Lisbon, it's about be doing it together, about our common home, about fraternity, which in Francis's mind is ecumenism. That's what it's all about, friends, in Francis's eyes. He goes on. The first is the protection of creation. There's COP 26, 27, and 28. There's Laudato Si. There's Sunday, friends. Our common home facing the threats of climate change and of shameless pollution also affecting the ocean. How can we claim to believe in young people if we do not give them healthy spaces in which to build the future, he asked. Here's Legato C, friends. Here's Sunday. And now Francis goes on. In a globalized world that brings us closer but fails to create fraternal closeness, he said, all of us are challenged to cultivate a sense of community a sense of closeness and solidarity. Friend, these ideas, fraternal, solidarity, community, all of us coming together, uniting together to save the planet. That's what Francis is talking about, friends. And so we have the two ideas Sunday, save the planet, community, ecumenism, unifying the entire planet 
on Francis's encyclical Laudato Si. Friends, we are looking at the great controversy right before our eyes. Right before our eyes, friends. Paul, go ahead, please. You know, it's amazing. I'm, uh, Rita and I are, are, are uh, enthusiasts, you know, with coral reefs, and we used to do a lot of snorkeling and all, and been hearing about how they're bad the last 20, not true. Go on YouTube and look up coral reef diving around the world. The barrier reef has come back in the last 30 years like gangbusters. All over the world, in the Philippines, in Bali, and, and just all over the place. The reefs, as they protect them, are flourishing. I mean, amazing. And this thing about a two degree temperature change, well, they're finding coral in the, Marina, in the Mariana Trench, five miles down, and it's like the same coral that's growing that they say two degrees will kill it. Really? How about going from 80 degrees down to 33 degrees. So this is all lies. And AOC, that phony Sandra, I'm not even going to get into that, said when we had, and you said he did this in Sicknickel eight years ago? Eight years ago, 2015. Remember what she said? Oh, we only have eight years left when she got into office. Where did she get that number from? Go back and look it up about climate change. She was well, so not enlightened not to use that number. So her brain power must have been low that day. Well, those eight years have come and gone. Where did she get that number from? So, and none of this is going to happen until the Lord says enough. Amen, Paul. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, so Paul's comment is, is that this idea that everything is changing because of the climate changing is a hoax, is a hoax. All to bring about an agenda. Here is Francis again in Lisbon, 2023, within the last month. And then we read from Fratelli Tutti, from another encyclical that came out within the last few years. The different religions, based on their respect for each human person as a creature called to be a child of God, contribute significantly to building fraternity and defending justice in society. Oh my! The church esteems the ways in which God works in other religions and rejects nothing of what is true and holy in these religions. I wonder how Francis, in his Fratelli Tutti, I wonder how he gauges what is true and holy in other religions. Friends, that's real simple. What is true and holy in another religion is only based on does it follow Roman Catholic dogma? <laughs> That's the bottom line, friends. The bottom line. Once more, we realize that no one is saved alone. We can only be saved together. That's the exact opposite, friend, of the Reformation. This is Roman Catholic dogma that is teaching that we are saved in groups. And the Protestant Reformation says that we are saved by faith created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Friends, it's an individual thing and Francis is flipping the entire message of Scripture for his ecumenical agenda. That's what he's doing, friends, in Fratella Tutti. So what Francis is bringing together three ideas. The climate, Sunday, and unity. 
Now friends, where have we heard that before? Where have we heard those ideas Great controversy, page 589-590. In every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest. Famine and distress follow. He imparts to the air a deadly taint. Thousands perish by the pestilence. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. Destruction will be upon both man and beast. Friends, what, what is Ellen White talking about there? She's talking about God allowing the devil access to the laboratories of nature and creating all kinds of devastation throughout the climate, imparting to the air a deadly taint, sweeping away harvest, famine and distress follow, tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes. She mentions just before she talks about this. So she talks about the climate and how the devil will seek to destroy the climate. So there's phase one of Pope Francis' agenda. Exactly as Ellen White said over a hundred years ago. And then, notice what she writes. Then the great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve God are causing these evils. The class that have provoked the displeasure of heaven will charge all their troubles upon those whose obedience to God's commandments is a perpetual reproof to transgressors. It will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath. That this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance shall be strictly enforced. What do we have, friends? Climate Sunday. And everybody has to come together. Everybody has to accept the spurious Sabbath, the false Sabbath of Rome, which is Sunday. Ellen White, in Great Controversy 589 and 590, is putting together, friends, all the elements that we see in the encyclicals of Pope Francis, climate change, Sunday, ecumenism. And we read it over a hundred years ago. That those who present the claims of the fourth commandment, thus destroying reverence for Sunday, are troublers of the people preventing their restoration to divine favor and temporal prosperity. You know, friends, I, I continue as I'm standing here. Malachi Martin, in the book, The Keys of This Blood, he said that John Paul II is looking for some miraculous event that would take place in this world, whether it be a, a, a calamity, we don't know. But John Paul was looking for something because of his adoration for the Virgin Mary, the demon Mary, if you will. 
And Malachi Martin said that John Paul saw that something would happen that would completely change the direction of the world. Friends, Francis continue today, continues to call for action, implementing Laudato Si. We'll see how it unfolds. But make no mistake about it, friend, the great controversy makes it very, very clear exactly what Ellen White said. It is exactly being proclaimed by Francis today. She saw today, friends. She saw today. Now, unbelievably, unbelievably, but again, Evan Sadler goes to one extreme, and then in Adventism we have another extreme. Unbelievable. John Pauline, Loma Linda University, the main theological professor at Loma Linda, recently in a discussion about Ellen White and end time events. He said this, our careful study of fulfilled prophecy out of careful study from the book of Revelation and reading these statements from Ellen White with the biblical principles in mind, we should be careful not to assume that the end time will be identical to great controversy in every detail. Friends, I, I want to say this graciously, but I want to say it firmly, into what beach, into what pile of sand has John Pauline put his head? We have just seen that the great controversy is being fulfilled to the letter. And John Pauline from Loma Linda University would dare, would dare to say this? This is insane, friends. For those in the denomination who are supporting Loma Linda and others, you supporting this, friends? This is, this is shameful. Considering both the Bible and world history, Pauline says, were Ellen White alive today, there is at least a chance that her depiction of the end would be different than it was in the 1880s. Ellen White, if she were alive today, would have written differently than she did in the 1880s. This is, this is just pure garbage, John Pauline. Garbage! Ellen White has pinpointed exactly what would happen. And from Great Controversy 589 and 590, we saw that Francis's encyclicals go exactly in line with what she said. But now we have John Pauline from Loma Linda University telling us that the end time events will not be as the great controversy says. And that if Ellen White were alive today, she would write very differently than she did back then. Hogwash! Hogwash, John Pauline. This is unbelievable, friends. And those in denomination, you're paying for this? You need to protest this. You need to demand this man be removed from Loma Linda. Unbelievable. After years of ecumenical dialogue with Rome, 
interfaith cooperation, and mutual trust. Seventh-day Adventists in Brazil are now working in partnership with Roman Catholics to give solidarity baths and vaccinations to the homeless. What? Friends, this goes back to John Pauline. This goes back to Ted Wilson being confused on the mark of the beast for seven years. Leaders who do not have any clue where they're going. And so now Seventh-day Adventists are uniting in community works with Roman Catholics. Unbelievable. Paul? Well, I guess Pauline must be on the bullet train. I suggest he read early writings in the vision of the, bull, of the bullet train because he's on board. Yes, he is. And, but yeah, I think they're all on the bullet train. They're not gonna derail the bullet train, and that's sad, that's sad. Seventh-day Adventist in name only. Absolutely, and Paul. they're proving it. By that, they're proving that her statements are 100% correct and in effect because they're Seventh-day Adventists in name only. Absolutely, Paul. It just tells us, as Seventh-day Adventists are fumbling the ball, uniting with Roman Catholics, butchering the spirit of prophecy, friends, we've got to do everything we can to get the great controversy out to the people. Everything we possibly can. I want to tell whoever it is, I to this day do not know, but I want to thank the individual that is sending us 50 cases, 50 boxes of books from harvest time. I want to say thank you publicly for sending those books to us and assure you, friend, they will be getting out very, very quickly. That's what we got to do, friends. We got to get the books out to people. We've got to get the great controversy. We've got to get the Sunday Law book and get them out there. Get them out there. These solidarity baths are designed to bring the participating churches in the, a church into unity as well as the homeless community. Solidarity with Rome will lead to reconciliation and bring an end to religious division. This is Vatican II. It's bringing the separated brethren back together. Unico Portal is a journalistic publication located in the city of Manuas, Brazil. June 15 of 2023, Unico Portal reported the following regarding the partnership between Seventh-day Adventists and Roman Catholics. The Seventh-day Adventist Church in partnership with the Catholic Church is organizing another edition of the Solidarity Bath for Homeless People. Uh, more than 200 volunteers will organize baths and other hygienic procedures for 150 people on the streets. They will have clothes to change, hygienic kits, consultation exams, in addition to haircut, nail cutting for women eyebrows. A social action will deliver 500 meals. There's absolute, and then here is the comment, and I thank Advent Messenger once again and I completely agree with them. There's absolutely nothing wrong with feeding the homeless. Great, feed the homeless. Provide for the needy. But to exploit this good work and use it as a ruse to inject the wine of Babylon by bringing all the churches together? Friends, we can help the poor. We can share the blessings that God has given to us. 
but to do it and, and promote unity and working together with Babylon the Great, friends? We're not to work with them, we're to call them out of their religious institution. Oh, friends. Oh, friends, where are the watchmen? Where are the watchmen, friends, today? The church needs watchmen. We need those who have the insight to see what God sees and the boldness to bring the needed warning. Where are the watchmen, friends? Where are the men and women calling sin by its right name? Where are the watchmen, friends? Where are the watchmen? Closing. Prophets and Kings, page 186, 187. The closing work of God in the earth. The standard of his law will be again exalted. False religion may prevail. Iniquity may abound, the love of many may wax cold, the cross of Calvary may be lost sight of, and darkness like the pall of death may spread over the world. Wow! Sounds like she's describing today, doesn't it, friend? Today! It's exactly what's going on. Today! The whole force of the popular current may be turned against the truth. Is that not happening now? There's no truth in the world, friends. There's no justice in the world today. It's fallen into the streets, as Isaiah tells us. Plot after plot may be formed to overthrow the people of God. Wow. Is there any hope left, friends? Is there anything to get courage from today? Oh, yes, there is. Yes, there is. But in the hour, in the hour of greatest peril, the God of Elijah will raise up human instrumentalities to bear a message that will not be silenced. Praise God, friends, this morning. Evan Sadler, shame on you for distracting people with that Jewish foolishness. Shame on you, John Pauline, for your insanity as people trust you to share prophecy with them. But you men, you, you're making your choices. But in the hour of greatest peril, the God of Elijah will raise up human instrumentalities to bear a message that will not be silenced. Praise the Lord. God has a people who will tell the truth, who will declare the Antichrist, who will declare who that first beast of Revelation 13 is. The God of Elijah will raise up human instrumentalities to bear a message that will not be silenced. Praise the Lord this morning, friends. In the populous cities of the land, in the places where men have gone to the greatest lengths in speaking against the Most High, the voice of of stern rebuke will be heard. Praise God, friends. We can hear about ecumenical Adventism. We can 
C standard bearers who should be pouring forth the truth, spewing out garbage and lies. Friends, the voice of stern rebuke will not be silenced. Boldly will men of God's appointment denounce the union of the church with the world. Earnestly will they call upon men and women to turn from the observance of a man-made institution to the observance of the true Sabbath. Fear God and give glory to Him. They will proclaim to every nation. And they will also proclaim, if any man worship the beast in his image. Do you think, friends, for one moment, that the people who give this final warning message, do you think they're going to be confused over who the beast is? Do you think they're going to tell the world that the beast is the Jews? Do you think they're going to say, well, you know, if Ellen White were alive today, she would probably interpret the beast far different than she did in the great controversy. What nonsense, friend. What nonsense. They will be clear that the beast is the papacy. His image are the apostate Protestant churches. And Sunday is the mark. They will be clear, friends. Praise the Lord. The voice, the voice of God through human instrumentalities will not be silent. Praise the Lord, friends. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you today that your truth is going to win. That your truth will be triumphant in this earth that all the world will know that there is a God in Israel. All the world will know the truths of the three angels' messages. Father, I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to fill your children to light a fire beneath us to get the great controversy and other books into people's hands. Please continue to use us to drop the books of truth for this time and the spirit of prophecy to drop them like the leaves of autumn. Help us to maintain our focus and to do and deliver this work and this truth in as many places as we can. In Jesus' name, amen.